Netflix After Hours Lou Reed tribute album. This came out in 2003. Three. Okay. Yes, you got a lot of mileage out of that one. Mm -hmm. That was uh, me. They called themselves the Cellar Birds, which was a splinter group from the Badlies. Mm -hmm. They were kind of prolific guys, so they have to, like the main writer is Brett Alexander. Mm -hmm. He wrote probably their hits. And the ones that got the most play, he's very into Dylan, John Fogarty, that Americana thing. And uh, so he has his things, I've done shows with him. And then the Cellar Birds were like the studio entity part of the Badlies. They had a very, very vibrant front man. He was voted sexiest man in Pennsylvania one time. He, was just, he, looked, like, he looked like young Sil Sylvester Stallone okay. with hippie hair, okay. right? And yeah, the women just loved him. And he was very charismatic, you know. And uh, I did a symphony gig with, his name's Pete Palladino. He's still around. I think he's running the bad news now. Um, and he, uh, he's in Philadelphia, like Rocky. And I did a symphony event with him where he read Twas the Night Before Christmas with the symphony. Mm -hmm. So he showed up, he had his tuxedo, he was all decked out, and all the way, you know, pr pressed pants, everything, and sneakers. <laughs> so well, he was that kind of guy. <laughs> but anyway, they're, yeah, they're very diverse people and, and they're great. And they're still back there cranking out the stuff. Awesome. And what inspired you to do a tribute to Lou Reed? What do you think? The record company. No. Oh, they said, well, really? here, here's the thing. Uh, I've always liked Velvet Underground, mm -hmm. and they were always in the background of my upbringing. I think I had White Light, White Heat first. Most people had the Banana record. I sure did. I, I got that yeah. one, and my guy was John Cale. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know how musical he is, how prolific he is. And that's what kept me with Velvet Underground, more so than Lou Reed, although I like Lou Reed quite a bit too. I had Berlin and different records over the years. Mm -hmm. So the record company went to this tribute album. I was already in their, their, their stable, and that was a song I chose. That sound I went for, I wanted to go more pop. And you look at the year that came out, it was late 66. That was the mm -hmm. era of the Monkees, the Turtles, Penny Lane. That, that's the zone I wanted to put it in. I even put in uh, Beach Boys Jingle Bells, the Sleigh Bells. All great bands. Have you heard of the Zombies? Oh, sure. They're coming to town Tuesday. Yeah. Are you guys going? I'm going to go. Well, we talked about it. Yeah. I'd yeah. be interested. I've, been, I've missed them the last couple times they were here. They've been touring pretty frequently. So. We were going to do a tour with them. I forget what year it was. It didn't materialize, but I was all excited. Yeah. <laughs> British Invasion band that you don't want to miss. And tell us a little bit more about how you became a musician and what inspired you. My dad said, if you touch the stove, you'll burn your hand. But if you touch the piano, you'll make music. <laughs> Actually, he didn't say that, but uh, it was a response to my environment. And I, uh, there's theories, all this brain research and why people become a musician and why does so-and-so become a plumber and whatever, occupation. It is an occupation for me, but it's also something that people can do as a hobby, as a diversion, all kinds of reasons. For me, not knowing those things when you're a kid, it was a way to connect with people and it was a way to, to deal with people. It was a way to, uh, some, some sort of coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. It was a safety zone for me. Huh. And I've even written that out for different things I've had to write about music. And I would say, you know, the bullies stopped picking on me when I played music. And people would like, just leave me alone. And, and even say, wow, that was pretty cool. You played that Herb Albert record by ear, or whatever it was. And then it just went from there. And then eventually, well, where I was, there was always music. We went to church, there was singing. The radio would be on. My dad was a record collector. He had a guitar sitting around. And we always had pianos. It was the, the end of that era where a lot of people had player pianos in the house, because that used to be the entertainment before radio. And 
if you were around grandparents that just had one. So that would be a place for me to go. When I visit people, I'd go play the piano. Eventually I took lessons, and then I started, I think age 10, that would be, for me, 1967, whoa. And the monkeys were on TV, and I my first record I ever bought was Penny Lane with Picture Sleep. And that was my way of connecting with other kids, too. Because then other kids, was, oh, I play this, I, my brother does this, and you know, and then you start invading everybody else's house. Good way to start out. <laughs> yeah. It, it was also, I guess, that time, you know, the 60s, things were changing politically and socially and um, musically, too. It was an interesting time of changes in cuisine, culture, technology, fashion, mm -hmm. music. And someone said, well, music's always been a language for people. I don't know. Historically, it goes in phases, because like the Baroque era, if you look back then, there was always music around. It was a big right. deal. They always had a string quartet in the corner or something. It was, it was a similar time. And fast forward to that period where there's explosions of technology and people right. getting on the moon and all this, and uh, a rediscovery of how powerful radio was. The radio changed everything in the 1920s. So fast forward to the 70s when you get all oh, night FM radio, you could play a whole side of Pink Floyd record. So the DJ could go to the restroom and get a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and all those things were coming along. So and now we it's cheaper than ever to make a record. Mm -hmm. People do it at home and next thing it's on YouTube or something. But it's not as good as Penny Lane. Let's get real. No, that was <laughs> that was right from the heart and also a lot of good technology on that too, besides the great song craft. For the time, I mean, you still listen to it now and you're like, wow, it's like you just wrote it. Um, my mom says watching the Beatles on TV on that Ed Sullivan show when they first came to America, there was something about uh, seeing them on TV and having that exposure that, you know, previous generations didn't have that, you know, being able to see their favorite band or yeah. the band that they've been listening to live. You know what I mean? That was kind of, I guess that would fall into technology. And um, how, do you, how do you think technology has helped or hindered music today, 50 years later? There's, there's a need for people to take responsibility for quality and realize that there's, there's a camp, you know, it's art for art's sake. And all the rules really work. There's some people say, oh, you have to put out art for, it's a commission or it's a, a reason, it's a mission, it's this, it's that. And sure, there are sometimes you write a song for somebody or about somebody or topic, protest song, uh, military themes, whatever, patriotic themes, there's all kinds of reasons to write songs. And that that's more of a functional approach. And then there's also, what Eric Satie called furniture music, meaning music that's important, but not, not necessarily to be listened to. It serves an environment. So there's a lot of different, they call it ambient music now. So there are a lot of different reasons to do the music. So tying that in with the tech, I think everybody needs to look at why am I doing this? They have the freedom to do it, certainly. You have the right to do it almost, and put it out there. So I think everyone needs to evaluate themselves. I can't control outcomes. I can't say, uh, like John Fogarty in his recent book mm -hmm. was talking about, they're like ants out there. All these artists putting out stuff. Huh. I think a question everyone, and it's because of the technology, it's gotten so easy. Mm -hmm. It used to be a big deal. You had to book a really expensive studio time and buy two inch tape. Two inch tape was 120 bucks to get six songs maybe on there. And then you'd go buy another reel mm -hmm. from the B-side. So it's all changed now. You can record infinite amounts of music and it doesn't cost you what it used to. So the question I ask for myself is, am I taking up space or am I making new space? In other words, is my music gonna go out there and create new frontiers, new images, fresh ideas, 
fresh motivation, make someone happy, or is it just going to take up space and just be another one of those things that the record collector geek says he has file number B <laughs> amongst all the other people file number B? At Amoeba, right? Yeah. <laughs> For record store day of all days. <laughs> yeah. We had, we had it covered today, too. Science Day and National Record Store Day. Woohoo! So we listened to Thomas Dolby, She Blinded Me With Science, all right. and the Bee Gees singing about Thomas Edison. <laughs> Covering all kinds of you know things that happened over the years. Right. Um, who do you think was more talented, the Bee Gees or Thomas Dolby? That's hard to say. <laughs> uh, I only know that one song by him. Did he do? I mean, he wrote other songs, obviously. Thomas Dolby. Yeah, he was an MTV darling, and he's a techie guy that actually was doing pioneering things on the side, you know, with the actual recording processes. He's still around. I believe he lives in the Bay Area. I saw something where he was like living, it wasn't like an RV, but it was something like an RV, and I was like, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know anybody else doing that, but that was, you know, within the past couple of years, so I guess he's still, he's still out and about, as they say. Hey, I have a track for you to play. Oh, sure. Because this ties a lot of what just occurred to me. Yes. Because so much of it was the result of technology. Uh-huh. It was recorded in Moscow, Russia, and places. Stockholm, and Kentucky, and Central Pennsylvania, Jesus. and all brought together because of technology. Uh-huh. Is it because the people you were recording with were based in these cities? Yes, it's a collage in a way. Uh, that would be number 12. Number 12 is called Exotic Animals and Beaches of Pennsylvania. And the cool thing about technology is that people can come together without getting 